In our study today, David has already been anointed once. We have already concluded the battle with Goliath. God has begun to reject King Saul. David knows he's going to be the next king of Israel. He's been anointed by God through Samuel. But David does not get the kingdom right away. What David's going to get is tribulation and hard times. David's going to be out in the run. David is going to go back to sleeping out in the fields. Instead of sheep, he's going to have to take care of men. And men are going to have to take care of him. But in 1 Samuel 18 and 11, he's still in the palace. The evil spirit comes upon Saul. And David plays. The music to soothe the savage beast. You got to be careful with music because you can glorify God or you can glorify the devil. And many of your modern and <clears throat> Christian crap today is worshiping the devil, worshiping self. And Saul cast a javelin, that's a type of weapon. For he said, I will smite David even to the wall with it. And David avoided out of his presence twice. This has happened twice. Saul was afraid of David. So see that David has done nothing. Saul is jealous. Saul is afraid. Saul has departed from God. And has come unto David. And Saul's first chance is to eliminate David. And what you're going to see throughout history and church history. You're not going to see the Christians with the javelin. With the sword. With a gun. Christians don't go and kill. You're going to see the enemies. Those that side with the world. Those that side with self. And those that side with the devil. Can a Christian pick up a gun and kill? Yes. Can a Christian pick up a sword and kill? Yes. Is it biblical? It depends, but we're not going to look at that. 19. 1 Samuel 19. 10. Verse 7, 19, 10. And Saul sought to smite David even in the wall with a javelin. This is a third time recorded. But he slipped away out of Saul's presence and he smote the javelin to the wall. And David fled and escaped that night. And then he goes off to Michael. And Michael puts the, 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 the image in the bed. David flees. Look at verse 18. So David fled and escaped and came to Samuel in Rimlah and told him all that Saul had done. And he and Samuel went and dwelt in Naoth. So Saul saying, Behold, David's in Naoth and Raymond. And Saul sent messenger. So now David's on the run. David has become an enemy. Of Saul. Okay. They're both anointed. They're both. By God. David has been anointed. Even with King Saul. On his throne. That's one of the problems. When you're dating the kings. 
so uh, Solomon is anointed king twice, put into the office of the throne while David's still alive. David, anointed king by Samuel, is going to sleep out in the grass, out in the woods. He's going to be out, in the, and we're not on time to look at it. That's not our study today. Look at 20, 33. And Saul cast a javelin at him to slay him, whereby Jonathan knew he was determined of his father to slay David. So he casts a javelin at, at Jonathan. So an, an angry effect of Saul is to take that javelin, I'm going to kill you. I'm not going to tell you Saul is a, is a lousy aim. I'm going to tell you the providence of God in that javelin. It is God that kept David alive at least three times. It is God that kept Jonathan alive at least once. And what we see here, what we're looking at here in 33 is I want you to see that Saul has proclaimed David to be an enemy. And David is anointed king. And King Saul is anointed the, uh, uh, king. Saul wants David murdered. Saul wants David killed. That's what the Pharisees and the scribes wanted of Jesus. And there are several times in the life of Jesus, they sought together how we may destroy him. They sought together how can we catch him in his word. They sought together what can we do to, to, to kill this man. What can we do to get rid of And they were anointed. Those chief priests, they were anointed. As Jesus Christ, Christ means anointed of God type of Christ. Jesus Christ, rightful throne of David, comes for 33 and a half years on this earth. He doesn't get a throne. He gets a crown of thorns, not gold. He doesn't get a, a seat, a judgment seat, a throne. He gets a cross. He gets a place to lay. He was buried in a tomb. And it wasn't even his tomb. At least when David dies, he dies in his tomb, his sceptre. And Jesus Christ came out, of, came out of the grave and seated at the right hand of the Father and will one day take that throne of David and will settle himself in Jerusalem during the millennium, King of kings and Lord of lords over the Hebrews, over the Jews, over Israel. Glory to God. So I want you to see that David is an enemy of Saul. Not David choosing. Saul's choosing. 24. 2. And Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all of Israel, went to seek David and his men upon the rocks of the wild goats. So Saul has gathered an army of the brethren of David through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Saul is of Benjamin. David is of Judah. He's gathered all these men. Saul wants a civil war. The thing is, they never battled David. They never come sword to sword, spear to spear. But Saul wants a civil war. And civil war is when you got two families, North and South, the Hatfields and McCormicks. You got Israel versus David. And David is the child of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. David's king. David's been anointed king. Saul is king. You would have had two kings if there was a battle, but there is no battle. And he came to the sheep coats, that's a place of sheep, in a way where it was a cave. And Saul went in to cover his feet, and a lot of people talk about the different things of 
covering his feet. And David's men remained in the side of the cave. So Saul goes in this cave. David and his men happen to be in this cave. And what God's going to do is he's going to try David. What you're going to do, David? And the men of David said unto him, Behold, the day in which the Lord is said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thy enemy into thy hand, that thou mayest do to him as thou shalt seem good unto thee. All right, here's the men of David doing what Satan did in Matthew 4. When Satan tempted Jesus three times, turn the bread into food. I will give you all these kingdoms if you fall down and worship me. You know, fall down from this part and the angels will protect me. That's what they're doing. But the problem, the problem lies is it's not the time. It's correct. That's a lot of problems with Christians. That's something I've come in my life. It's right, but it's not the right timing. There's a big difference. It could be a calling of God. It could be David anointed to be king. But not right now. Behold, I will deliver thy enemy in thy hand, that thou mayest do unto him it seems good unto thee. And David arose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe trivially. Men shall not wear what pertains to a woman, a woman not pertaining to a man. Uh, man, where's your skirt? Because Saul had a skirt, and Saul was a male. And it came to pass afterward, David's heart smote him because he had cut off Saul's skirt. He didn't cut Saul. Saul had no wounds afflicted to him. Saul had no blood, no skin, no bruise. His skirt was cut by David. And David, David, oh, I repent. And he said unto his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master. The Lord's anointed. The Lord's anointed. Saul is the Lord's anointed. The stretch forth my hand against him, seeing he's anointed of the Lord. And then he goes up to King Saul, and he repents, and he bows down. And he, says, he says, you know, we had opportunity. But David didn't do nothing. The only thing David did was cut off his skirt. And even that, he repented. Did David have a sword? Oh, yes, he did. Did his men have a sword? Oh, yes, there were weapons. But it's not time. There have been Christians who had upset ministry. Because it wasn't their time to do what they wanted to do. It wasn't God's timing. There have been families destroyed. There have been people destroyed. There have been businesses destroyed. Because somebody has taken action. And it may have been right. But it wasn't the right time. Is it the throne of David? Not yet. Not yet. David spares him. All he does is cut off his, his, his the skirt. 26. 6. Then answered David said to Elimelech, the Hittite, the answer like, is there right, brother Joab, who will go down with me to Saul in the camp? And Abishai said, I will go down with thee. And David and Abishai came to the people by night, and behold, Saul lay sleeping in the trench. David's come to Saul. Saul's sleeping. They're both anointed by God. Saul is the king. David is the king, but not yet. And his spear stuck in the ground. Saul's spear stuck at his bolster, where you carry your water. But Abner and the people laid round about him. Then said Abishai to David, God has delivered thee into the enemy of thy hand this time. This is the second time. Now, therefore, let me smite. Okay, David. Back in verse 20, chapter 24, 
you cut off his skirt. You wouldn't do any damage to him. You didn't cut him. You didn't hurt him. You didn't bruise him. You didn't hit him. You didn't smite him. You just cut off his skirt. I'll tell you what, David, after I says, let me kill him. I pray thee with the spear even to the earth at once. Hey, I got a spear in my hand. I got a weapon right now. I'll smite him, and I only do it once. And that, smite, and that spear will go through the ground like J.L. did with the nail and the hammer to Caesarea. I will smite him to, I will not smite him the second time. I will kill him the very first time, David. Not you, David. But you know why David? Because David is the commander. David is, is the captain. David would be charged with the murder or the killing given Abishai permission David would be at fault. So let's say you hire somebody or you tell somebody, go kill this person. Whatever relationship. And they go and kill that person. You are guilty too because you ordered it. So David would still be at fault. And David said to Abishai, destroy him not. For who can stretch forth a hand against the Lord's anointed, second time, and be guiltless? And David said, furthermore, as the Lord liveth, the Lord shall smite him. Let God do it. Not, not me, not you. Let God do it. Or his day shall come, he shall descend in the barrel, battle and perish. David's a prophet. God forbid that I should stretch forth my hand against the Lord's anointed. Even if you kill him, it's my hand. But I pray thee, take thee now a sphere that's in thy bolster and cruise of water and let us go. And David took the spear and the cruise of water from Saul's bolster. They got them away. And no man saw it. No man knew it. Neither awakened. For they were all asleep because a deep sleep from the Lord was fallen upon them. God had David and Saul in that cave. I want to see what you're going to do, David. God caused a deep sleep upon King Saul. I want to see what you do, David. And both times, David did not kill Saul. But he was anointed. They're both anointed. Romans 13. Oh, amen. Romans 20. Okay, we did. Romans 13. Now, there are some people that have a problem. There are Christians out there who are professing Christians that has a problem with President Biden. And as bad as he is, as wrong as he is, I don't believe he's saved. He's not even following his own Catholic church. Due to this fact is, you know how bad Saul was? You know how wicked Saul was? And he was still anointed by God. And David didn't kill him. David did not assert the authority over the government of King Saul set by God. Excuse me. God sent King Saul. David respected that. Dave, David would not do his own thing. David would not let the men in his troop do his, their own thing. But he honored the anointed of the Lord, even though King Saul was a wicked man. Listen, we've had Republican wicked leaders also. It's not just Democrats, but let every soul be subject, every soul, saved or lost, unto the higher powers, president, vice president, judicial leaders, governors, mayors, police, boss, husband, 
mom, dad, the babysitter. For there is no power but of God. Okay, so, but the Lord is still Lord. Jehovah was still on his throne. And there'll be a far more, more wicked kings coming in Israel's history. But God's still God. President Biden, God is still God. Former President Trump, God is still God. Former President Bin Laden, Bin Laden. Oh man. Woohoo. Boy, that was a slip. <laughs> There are you laughing out there right now. Obama. God is still on his throne. Your boss. God is still on his throne. You are to be subject to those powers. They are ordained of God. You ordained preacher? Well, the President of the United States is ordained by God. There it is. Whoso therefore resists the power, you resist the Democrat power. You resist the CEO. You resist the police. You resist the, the education that you're under. You resist the ordinance of God. There it is. I don't care if it's King Saul. I don't care if it's King David. God is still in his throne. Jesus, 33 and a half years on this earth, God was on this throne. You're going to have the Antichrist seven years. God is still in his throne. John. John 18, this is the only place, John 18, 10, you find any, any, listen to me, you'll find any Man or woman saved. Any saint. This is the first time and the only time. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it, smote the high priest's servant, and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Melchus. Then said Jesus, Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword unto thy sheep. The cup which my father has given me, shall I not drink of it? This is the only place a saint picks up a weapon and Jesus rebukes him. In nowhere do you see any of the disciples, any of the apostles, any of the Christians, Acts, Paul, or any of Paul's writings. Do you not see them? Picking up a sword or a weapon. But Peter. And he's rebuked. Acts. 12. Now about the time Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. He killed James the brother of John with a sword. Because he saw it pleased the Jews he proceeded further to take Peter also. You know who the one who has the weapons? It's the unsaved. You know who's killing in the malls, the theaters, the schools, transportation? It's the unsaved. Church shootings are the unsaved comes into church and starts killing. Rarely will you find a born again Bible believing Christian killing. 
Really? Usually it's justified. I'm not I'm not here for gun. I'm not here for Democrat and Republican. I'm just here telling you about David. David respect the authority that he had, even though it was a wicked, wild, perverted man. That same man was trying to kill a saint, David. Here's a wicked king out to kill saints. Christians. He already killed James. Now what's what is the Christian sword? Ephesians six seventeen. The Christian sword is take the helmet of salvation, get saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Take your Bible. You see, that's my sword. Yeah, that's my sword. That's my two-edged sword. Sharp, well-used, well-gripped, well-handled, well-marked. That's my sword. We're going to attack. We're going to attack with the Bible. We're going to attack with Scripture. I don't go bang, bang, bang. Oh, you're no, I'm not against guns. I'm not going against guns at all. Hebrews 4.12. Hebrews 4.12, about my sword, your sword. The word of God is quick, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even to dividing and sunder of soul and spirit, not body, not flesh, of joints. And you know what happened with King Saul with the rightfulness of David living right, doing what God wanted to? It pierced the soul of, of Saul. It made him angry. It made him furious. That man is doing right. I hate it. That's what unbelief people. That's the problem. You know, I told my daughter, she says, there are people at work that, that pick on her and all. I said, because they hate you. Because you're doing right and they're not doing right and they know it. That's why they pick on you. They're jealous. Of the joints and marrow and discern the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's your sword, Christian. That's your sword. Now, one more place I forgot in Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, 34. Quench. Now, this is the history of God's people. Quench the violence of fire. Escape the edge of the sword. There have been men and women in the Old Testament and church age history. They have escaped the edge of the sword. David, even Paul, Peter in Exodus 12, I mean, excuse me, uh, uh, Acts 12, he, the Holy Spirit lets him out. But also, verse 37, they were stoned. They were killed by being stoned. They were sawed asunder, cut in half, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They were Men of God, women of God in the Old Testament, James, one of them in the New Testament, Stephen was stoned. By the ungodly, by the lost. You let the ungodly do ungodly things. And you do what the scripture tells you to do. And you're not going to die until God wants you dead. Until God wants you dead, they're not going to kill you. Now, last place, Romans. Romans 5. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
There's a lot of times I bet you David had peace. And I bet you there's a lot of times David had fear. You read Psalms? David scared to death. David rejoiced. <laughs> by whom we also have access by faith unto the grace where we stand. Rejoice in hope of the glory of God. All right, now look at David. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. Tribulations, David was, he was on the run from Saul. How many times they came almost in contact? How many times they came in contact? How many times Saul sent out people to, to seek David, to kill him? Tribulation. Why? Knowing tribulation worked with patience. You know what David learned? Hey, here's your opportunity. Kill him. No, no, no. I'm not touching the Lord's anointing. Okay, David, you won't kill him. Let me kill him. One time, I'll kill him. No, listen. God will kill him. God will take care of him. He just settled down and relax. Trust in the Lord. That's what David learned. Through the entire life of David, he learned his tribulation work is patience. And patience works experience. What did he learn? He had a he had a military. He had his own men. He learned how to deal with people. He learned how to deal with, we ain't got no food. How to deal with, man, we are so tired, we can't even take one step. I've been there. I have been so tired, I came home and just passed out on my bed. David learned, hey, you know what? Men don't always listen to you. David learned, men have wants and desires. Men will fight. Men could be your best friend. David learned your best friend could stab you in the back. David learned that, you know what, your wife is not always faithful. David learned many things from patience and from tribulation. So when God did prepare that throne for him, he would have tribulation in the kingdom just because tribulation comes. With that tribulation, he would have patience. Well, David, shall we gather all the men and go to bath? Let's see what happens to them first. Okay, David, we're going out. You know what David learned with, with the Bathsheba episode? You know what he learned after that? When it's time for war, get out there and go to war. And from the experience, you learn hope. David had great hope in Jehovah. David had great hope in Israel. David had great hope for the temple. Are you in tribulation? We're all in tribulation, somehow, some way. But take the tribulation, learn patience. I'm battling Lord right now. I've had many health things in my life right now. You see, I'm wearing oxygen now. I've had many good ministries here in Daytona Beach, and they all closed down. They're done. The Lord closed the door. I'm sitting here. Three weeks ago, I think it is now, I had a mild heart attack. Had it been the right side of my heart, it would not have been a pulmonary uh, condition. It would have been dead. <laughs> That's how much I know. That's what they told me. If it was on the other side of my heart, I would not be. So God has me here for a reason. And I'm praying to God through the tribulation of men. I'm trying to work the patience to know and learn experience because I hope God will use me. I just don't know how he's going to use me yet. But I got that hope. I've learned things. And I became patient. I was impatient. I had an episode, this, this, I think it was this weekend it was. They were like, wow, man, you were, I was sitting there and just, and this thing took a long time. They said, wow, you just sat there. You, you. 
God's working patience on me. Getting experience. Learning things. Hope's coming. Hope is coming. <laughs>